I have a question regarding the Hasidic community, uh, and I don't know if you have any ties with Canada, but um, I know t I'm close to Montreal, and uh, there, are, there are ties there. And in Montreal, like in the rest of Canada, maybe with some exception in New Brunswick, but I'm not even sure it is holding now, uh, there is a complete ban on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the, the government, the federal government, the provinces have been extremely proactive in banning that uh, type of medicine and uh, there is no movement. In the US you have at least a number of doctors treating people. In France also you have a big debate in France. In Canada, I can promise you, th there is a handful of people who n basically take uh, early treatment seriously. And still, uh, Montreal was not that far from New York in terms of mortality. It, it was uh, one of it was the epicenter of Canada. So I was wondering if you, if you heard about how people uh, in in your community in Montreal were dealing with the disease and maybe you have a message to the Canadian authorities because this is not going away. There, are, uh, there will be infections, maybe not a big wave, but there will be continued infections for a while and people need treatment. So yes, I do have connections uh, with Montreal. Many of my patients have family in, in Montreal. And so I did get a lot of um, uh, people reaching out to me and I'll tell you a really tragic uh, case there was a, a young woman in her late 20s who was uh, six months pregnant diagnosed with COVID uh, she reached out to me because her family are my patients and she lived in Montreal and I um, she asked me what, what I recommend and I said I definitely recommend that she starts treatment because pregnancy second and third trimester is a high risk and um, she said thank you, and she called her doctor, um, and they refused to give it to her. Six days late, later, she had, had uh, pulmonary infarcts and bilateral strokes. She lost her baby, and she is still on a ventilator, and we're talking about two months later. That's what I'm familiar with, and this is, you can scale that by hundreds, of, if not thousands of cases that I've uh, heard, because what happened is, uh, initially, I was really the only vocal, uh, you know, uh, the, really the only vocal force giving hope and and uh, kind of a treatment option besides go home and wait until you need a respirator. And so the entire world started calling me. I remember one day I had over 10,000 um, texts. I developed calluses on my fingers from, <laughs> from texting so much. And uh, it just became unbelievable. So my focus, I realized, needed to be on educating providers uh, in different communities in different parts of the world so that they could uh, then treat their own communities. Because how could one person... So that's what I did. I started uh, trying to physicians, uh, hospital systems, anyone who would listen. And uh, the word did get out, and, and thank God. And uh, so the, the burden on me personally got reduced. So my message to not only to, to, to Canada, but to any, any government, any person in power, is uh, even if you have selfish motives and you, and you want to preserve your own uh, positions of power, uh, what I strongly recommend is that you look out for the best interests, interests of, the, of your people, of your constituency, because they rely on you for policy and give access to, to life-saving medication. You have the logistical uh, capability to provide for, the, for humanity, for your people, um, the right medication at the right time. So you have a, a decision to make, uh, and I'm talking to all the politicians in the world, you want to be part of the solution or part of the problem? Um, because if you're part of the solution, you'll be, be, be you, you historically as, uh, you know, good people who helped end the pandemic and helped relieve uh, misery and, and preserve the sanctity of life. On the other hand, if you choose, choose to be motivated by politics or um, big pharma, pharma uh, influence or your own arrogance, 
then I believe, rightfully so, history will view you as uh, uh, mass murderers and guilty of crimes against humanity. Because now you know, it's not I'm no longer a secret, that if you use uh, early intervention in high-risk patients using uh, zinc, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or any other antibiotic like doxycycline, you can reduce hospitalization by 84%. And most likely uh, reduce uh, death by, uh, you know, a factor of five, if not more. So you have to ask yourself this question: you know, how do you want history to view you? How do you want God to view you? I mean, that's how. That's what I would answer. I'm trying, like you, to 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 understand, but uh, uh, what you mentioned that people in power know. I think, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not necessarily correct in the sense that uh, they are advised by people who are telling them, oh, there is no randomized controlled trial, it's unproven, etc. Uh, that happens in some countries, like Canada. It's an amazing example where you cannot have access to treatment whatsoever. And uh, But, of course, other countries have taken a completely different route uh, and, and you know that the mortality rates are much lower in those countries. Uh, and then some countries are acting a bit late, like Brazil, but it's amazing what is going on. You have thousands and thousands of doctors uh, who have mobilized with uh, you know, protocols similar as yours. So, so there is still this huge uh, I issue of information, I think, uh, to, the, to the political uh, sphere, to the... Uh, because I think they are totally, totally disinformed by uh, uh, by by the bureaucracy. Uh, I I think that's what is going on in Canada, and uh, I was wondering, you see, if you can extend an invitation to Justin Trudeau to visit your practice, uh, for example, and then you can spend a day with him explaining how you you receive patients, how you diagnose them, how you treat them. Uh, I think it would make a world of change because these people are, I think, disinformed by the bureaucracy. It's as bad as that, and the media is 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 playing a role that is uh, uh, that is uh, basically reinforcing that disinformation uh, uh, about uh, the only approach there that. Uh, how we need that randomized trial. I can, I can, but anyway, I'm interviewing you. Uh, I'd like to talk about the social media, if you don't mind, but maybe on a different angle. The, these are big corporations. They have many employees. Many of the employees are going to get COVID. This has huge implications. Uh, like for any corporations, you see, the, uh, all this question of corporate responsibility, how to deal with... Uh, 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 with a disease that, if not treated early, can have devastating implications for for the functioning of these corporations. Uh, do you think there is a, a way to to send a message to big corporations about their, that it's in their self-interest uh, for their employees to to get early treatment? I mean, sure. I mean, uh, if if it's a corporation that. Uh, understands that the human resource is really the most valuable resource of any business, then you want to protect that resource as much as possible and prevent, uh, you know, days off from being sick and so on. So even from a completely uh, self-motivated profit perspective, it would make sense to intervene early so that your workforce stays, stays healthy and you uh, maximize your productivity. I mean, that's just common sense.